I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. Today we're telling a story of siblings born and bred to run the world. They were the most infamous family of the 20th century. Their story drips with conspiracy. Their names whispered through the decades since they left their voices echoing in time and space. Their hands helped mold the America we know, sharing with their country dreams of landing on the moon, freedom for every man. And by example, they inspired generations to reach the highest heights. They played with fire, and only a few survived. Their words ring through our history books, their pretty faces on our television screens, and their signature will forever be stamped on our national identity. They stood in the trenches. We stood beside them. They flashed their diamonds. We flashed our cameras. They had their fun, and we saluted them. They were good. They were evil. They were human. They are the Kennedy siblings. We will now be tuning your radio to 1936. The war to end all wars is in the rearview mirror, and yet some of the greatest evil the world has ever seen is just peeking over the horizon. Every man, woman, and child will be faced with the question of who they are and who they are going to be. Because, though no one knows it yet, this will be the fight of their lifetime. In 1936, Jack Kennedy was guaranteed a place at Harvard. Despite graduating high school at 65th in a class of 110, but nepotism. Joe Jr. was already attending there, and it was Joe Sr.'s alma mater, so no-brainer, right? It's Harvard. But Jack was not about to fall into that trap. Instead of making a nice, cozy home in the shadow of Joe Jr., which would have been all that was waiting for him at Harvard, Jack opted for Princeton instead. His father approved because it was evidence of independence in Jack. But Joe Sr. was also pleased when Jack decided he would like to follow in his big brother's footsteps and ask to study abroad for a year under the same socialist academic as Joe Jr. had just two years earlier. Independent thought was great and all, but... Joe Sr. agreed that some tradition was important. And after all, Joe Jr. was the Kennedy standard. There was but one problem. Europe and Harold Lasky and socialism and eugenics and anti-Semitism and Hitler. So there were many problems on the horizon for Joe Sr. And we've got to talk about all of them. Let's start with Harold Lasky. He was an English political theorist and economist, and he was far left in his ideologies, being a huge advocate for Marxism and a supporter of Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union. Marxism is a philosophy on how a country should operate, and it highly praises communism. Well, Lasky had a huge effect on Joe Jr., In 1933, after graduating from Choate, Joe Jr. spent a year in London studying under him. Joe Sr. had arranged for Joe Jr. to travel all over Europe and study under the top financial, literary, religious, political, and academic leaders who were active at the time. Now keep in mind, this is just after the stock market crash of 1929, and the effects of the Great Depression are very fresh. It caused destabilization in many countries, not just the U.S., and the unrest in Europe was crippling. A lot of it was also left over from World War I. In fact, shortly after World War I, the inflation was so high in Germany that it took 4 billion German marks to equal one American dollar. 
By 1923, at the height of the inflation crisis, it was one trillion German marks to one American dollar. German people quite literally needed a wheelbarrow to carry enough paper money to the store to buy a loaf of bread, or even a few wheelbarrows, depending on what moment. Well, in Europe, the war had never really ended. Not the world, but the war. <laughs> world War I had never really ended. There was just about like a two-decade intermission, and then the fighting just reconvened. Obviously, people change drastically when their security and quality of life is threatened in this way. Things will happen that would not normally happen, and people will behave in a way that they would never behave under usual circumstances. By the time Joe Jr. went to Europe to study, Adolf Hitler had already come into power in Germany and was starting to target the Jews. And here is where the Kennedy family picked up a little conspiracy. The whisperings that this golden American family may have been Nazis. While in Europe during his studies and after visiting Germany and seeing Hitler's power over the people there, Joe Jr. wrote to his father to share his thoughts. And they are what you could call alarming. He was back in London after his trip to Germany and was hearing, quote, condemnation of Hitler and his party from English leaders. Joe Jr. told his father that he thought they were being too harsh. He wanted to see what was going to happen with Hitler and wasn't so sure that the Nazis wouldn't be great for society. He observed that because of the First World War and the Great Depression and the economic effects following, the Germans were, quote, scattered, despondent, and divorced from hope. And if you know anything about World War II and Hitler's reign, you probably know how he was able to come into power and have the influence that he did. Hitler found a way to give vulnerable, hopeless people hope. He gave them someone to blame. The Jews. Joe Jr. continued, quote, It was excellent psychology, and it was too bad that it had to be done to the Jews. This dislike of Jews, however, was well-founded. Brutality must have been necessary to secure the wholehearted support of the people. In every revolution, you have to expect some kind of bloodshed. He even told his father that he thought that Hitler's sterilization program was, quote, a great thing. I don't know how the church feels about it, but it will do away with many of the disgusting specimens of men which inhabit this earth. End quote. Which, if you remember from Rosemary's first episode, the third episode this season, we talked about the popularity of the belief system called eugenics. Hitler's sterilization program was very, very much based on those ideas and principles. Hitler sought to forcefully sterilize anyone suffering from a physical or mental disease, including schizophrenia, manic depression, which is bipolar, epilepsy, blindness, deafness, physical deformity, and alcoholism. From 1933, when Hitler signed this sterilization law to the end of World War II in 1945, 400,000 people had been sterilized. Joe Jr. concluded his letter with, quote, In all, I think it is a remarkable spirit which can do tremendous good or harm, whose fate rests with one man alone. It's bad. It's so bad. And we also need a bit of perspective. The Germans weren't hypnotized by Adolf Hitler. It was more like they had been prepped by previous events and were waiting for a savior. And Hitler saw an opportunity to tell the German citizens what they wanted to hear, that it was them against the world. And he would be their fearless leader who would show them the way to the world domination that they were totally capable of and deserved. Hitler presented a plan what he called, quote, the final solution. As if he were solving an existing problem, as if he were righting wrongs. His solution was the Holocaust. But I also need to make sure that we're clear here. In our timeline, the mid-1930s, almost 
no one knew what was actually happening. The U.S. and other countries were aware that the Jews were being persecuted. But concentration camps and mass genocide? No. They didn't know that until they stormed the streets and saw it with their own eyes. Hitler was smart. In fact, most German soldiers, most Nazis, didn't know the extent of what was really happening. We're not going to be giving a play-by-play or analysis of World War II because, well, this is a sibling podcast. But if you're interested, I would encourage you to go check out another history podcast because it really is so important and will give you a lot of context to the time period. So Joe Sr., upon receiving these very disturbing letters from his son, quickly responded. He encouraged his son congratulating him for paying attention and coming up with an idea of his own. But he also shut it down as quickly as he could, stating that Hitler had gone, quote, far beyond his necessary requirements in his attitudes toward the Jews. Joe also forgot to mention the fact that Rosemary would have fallen under those same sterilization laws or drive home how inhumane and purely evil it all was. Joe Sr. also tried to advocate later to negotiate and try to appease Hitler rather than going to war and stopping him. And that was where Winston Churchill had to step in and set everyone straight, which we will be getting to. The twist, though? I don't understand, but Joe Jr.'s teacher, whom he greatly respected and got a lot of his political influence from, was Jewish. And somehow, at the very same time Joe Jr. is picking up these anti-Semitic ideas, remember, Jack was supposed to also spend time in Europe and study under Harold Lasky, but fate, once again, intervened. Jack's health took a sharp downhill turn, and so he had to head back to the States in October 1935, after only being in England for a month And he was 18 at this point, just graduated from high school at Choate. So since he's back in the States and not going to be studying in London, he skips ahead in his plan and enrolls in Princeton. At first, they deny him because he was so late enrolling in the semester, he would be severely behind. But his dad recruited a prominent Princeton alumni to pull some strings and the school let him in. He lasted just over a month before having to be hospitalized again. He was admitted to a hospital in Boston because he started having major intestinal issues. And then after he was discharged, he moved to Palm Beach, Florida to further heal and rest up at the Kennedy Winter Home. Then he and Joe Jr. spent the spring of 1936 working as ranch hands on a 40,000-acre cattle ranch in Arizona. Despite his health struggles, Jack was never going to give up the opportunity to spend a whole summer with his big brother, Joe Jr. Quote, I needed workers, so when the Kennedy boys came, I worked the hell out of them. They were willing and hard workers. Jack was 18 and Joe was two years older when the brothers arrived here in April 1936 and the two left in September. The rancher, Spiden, said they were, quote, soft, but not too much out of shape when they arrived, and, quote, leather tough and tanned when they left. So random, but anyway, all of that to say, guess where old Jack ends up? With Joe Jr. at Harvard. Of course. Kick was very upset by this because in 1935, she and Jack had actually boarded an Art Deco luxury ocean liner together and had traveled to Europe for him to go study under Harold Lasky and for her to go to the Sacred Heart Convent in Paris to strengthen her French. They were excited to be in Europe, just the two of them. They would be in different countries, but Europe isn't all that big and they planned to meet up and travel during their holidays and vacations. 
Honestly, it was probably for the best because during the months that Jack was in Europe or weeks that Jack was in Europe, he was allegedly more concerned with enjoying England's social life than he was with studying while he was there. In a continuation of the Joe Jr. Jack dynamic at Choate, Jack's big brother continued to overshadow him and was the best known member of his class at Harvard. Quote, Jack was bound to play second fiddle, a Harvard student said. Whereas Joe was big enough and strong enough to play varsity football, Jack was big enough and strong enough to maybe make the sophomore JV team. Another fellow student described Joe Jr. as, quote, slender and handsome, with a heavy shock of hair and a serious, slightly humorless manner. He was much interested in politics and public affairs and was every faculty member's favorite. It's reported that the teachers at the school liked Joe specifically as a person, not just because of who he was. There were two Roosevelts at Harvard during the same time, and allegedly no one was as fond of either of them as they were of Joe Jr. And not only was Joe successful in academics, popularity, and sports, He also was politically successful at Harvard within their campus student council and had publicly stated that it was his dream and life plan to be a politician. In Robert Dalek's book, he said that within the Kennedy family, it was an unspoken rule that the eldest son had first dibs on a political career and that Joe Jr. left no doubt that this was his life's ambition and that he was calling dibs. He won his student council election in college, and apparently Jack ran as well, but he lost. He wasn't elected, but Joe Jr. was. So what happened to turn the tides to JFK being the one who everyone helped become president instead? Here's a quote from Jack's Harvard tutor during this time. Though his mind is still on discipline and will probably never be very original, he has ability, I think, and gives promise of development. Okay, Beth, remember that story when Jack was arguing with Joe Jr. and like one of their friends started to speak up on Jack's behalf or take his side. And then Jack was like, keep out of it. I'm talking to Joe, my brother. I don't think he said my brother. No, he didn't. (laughs) Okay. I'm talking to, yeah, I'm talking to Joe. I thought that they were like 10, 11, 12 here. No, 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 no. no. (laughs) No. I found the details surrounding the story, and it was actually when they were both at Harvard together, one of the football store stores. (laughs) (laughs) One of the football stars, Torbert McDonald, told the story and said, quote, After practice was over, Jack would have me throw the ball for him, and he'd practice snagging passes for an hour at a time. Hundreds of passes. One day, Joe Jr. told him, Jack, if you want my opinion, you'd be better off forgetting about football. You just don't weigh enough and you're going to get hurt. I said, come off it, Joe. Jack doesn't need looking after. Jack turned on me and said, mind your own business. Keep out of it. I'm talking to Joe, not you. It's just such a quintessential sibling dynamic. Joe being the older brother trying to be like wise and protective and Jack being like, you know what, back off. But then he's going to say that to Joe and then a friend steps in and he's like, no, 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 no. Okay, no. (laughs) Though he was still living in Joe's shadow, Jack accomplished and mastered two things during his first two years at Harvard, winning friends and influencing people. And therein lies his superpower. I don't know if he read the book, but he was definitely living out the principles. Quote, A gangling young man with a slightly snub nose and a lot of flap in his reddish brown hair. Remembered a classmate. With his long, coltish stride, his bright young face, which stood out in the class. He still wasn't quite as popular as his older brother, but he was well-known and well-liked by his peers. Quote, Anytime you were with Jack Kennedy you would laugh. An athlete friend recalled. Lem Billings agreed, quote, Jack was more fun than anyone I've ever known. And I think most people who knew him felt the same way about him. Jack wrote Billings in October of 1937, quote, I am now known as Playboy. So we can assume some other things from that as well. I can't help it, he said. I can't be my good looks because 
I'm not much handsomer than anybody else. It must be my personality. When Billings responded that he was only so successful with women because he was Joseph P. Kennedy's son, Jack set out to prove him wrong. They both went on blind dates and switched their identities. So Lem was to be Jack Kennedy and Jack was to be Lemoyne Billings. Lem even took Joe Kennedy's Rolls Royce out for the occasion. And here's what Billings had to say. Quote, We had one very competitive night trying to see who would do better. And I'm afraid, as I recall, he was satisfied with the results. Jack even got demoted to the third string football team as a punishment for this type of behavior, but it did not slow him down. This womanizing was obviously an impersonation of his father. A girlfriend of Jack's recalled, quote, He said his father went on all of these trips and was gone so much of the time, and he'd come back and give his mother some very lavish presents. A big Persian rug or some jewelry or something like that. Obviously, Jack knew everything that was going on in his parents' marriage. Stories from Grandpa Fitz also reinforced that it was totally fine and normal to completely ignore your wedding vows. Like we said in the Bouvier episodes, it could be seen as borderline brainwashing. Okay, brace yourselves for this story. It makes me so mad and so sick. Every time I even mention like, oh, makes me sick. Bethany's like, I know what you're talking about. I know the story. I hate this story. So Jack would tell, quote, locker room stories about his father's conquests. And one time he told a story about when his freaking father tried to get in bed with one of his sister's friends while removing his robe. He said, Quote, this is going to be something you'll always remember. <laughs> yeah, because trauma. I hate him. Like, it's actually... It's... I don't even have words. And Jack used to tell his friends that would come to visit the Kennedy compound and stay over that they should, quote, Be sure to lock the bedroom door. The ambassador has a tendency to prowl late at night. That is seriously senile. Rose hated it. She would get really, really upset anytime she heard a story about Joe. But for some reason, her kids were more on Joe's side and even helped their dad find girls at times. A Washington, D.C. socialite said that one time in the 1940s, Joe Sr., Jack, and Bobby Kennedy invited her to their table in a really upscale restaurant and then proceeded to explain that Joe would be in town for a few days and, quote, needed female companionship. They wondered whom I could suggest, and they were absolutely serious. And then there's another story about when Joe visited Hollywood in the 1950s, And his daughter, Patricia, who was married to actor Peter Lawford at the time, asked the wife of a TV producer to get the names and phone numbers of female stars her father could give a call. The dynamic is just so inappropriate. It's crazy. Like, it doesn't seem real. And like, I kind of understand like boys being like that, but Patricia... Like, Even the boys, it's so disgusting I mean, I, and weird. Obviously, yeah. Like they're all just sitting at a table, fathers and sons, call a uh, another woman yeah, over. No, I could, yeah, I can't, I can't get there either. To ask her, like, hey, uh, that's so uncomfortable. Okay, so that we can keep our lunch in our stomachs, let's move on, shall we? Please. During the summer of 1937, Jack and Lim Billings took a European trip to further their education. They visited every museum, tons of churches, and all the great landmarks of the old world. Most of their records from this trip is just commentary on political situations in Western Europe, so I'm definitely not going to get into any of that. But there is one thing that is interesting that they commented on, that they, along with most of Europe's citizens, did not think that there was any chance that there could be a war between Germany and France. 
let alone a freaking world war, let alone the biggest war to ever happen. Now, that is interesting because Joe Jr. was there years before. Right. And at this point, Jack and Lem still don't think that there's going to be a war at all. Or the German citizens. And they're actually like rubbing shoulders with the political leaders and they're around people who should know what's going on. Jack also wrote that the French were incredibly annoying and took advantage of American tourists at any chance they got. He wrote, We have now acquired the habit of leaving the car around the block to keep the hotel price from going up. These French will try and rob at every turn. France is quite a primitive nation. He thought France was well prepared for Germany, though. And if you know anything about World War II, they were fragile and required rescuing. Germany was worse. Quote, We had a terrible feeling about Germany, Billings recalled, and all the Heil Hitler stuff. They were extremely arrogant. The whole race was arrogant. The whole feeling of Germany was one of arrogance. The feeling that they were superior to us and wanting to show it. The Germans were insufferable. We just had awful experiences there. They were so haughty and so sure of themselves. Jack and Lim had fun mocking them and throwing their heads back and saying, Hiya, Hitler! Instead of Heil Hitler. Mm-hmm. See, they were obviously joking about it. Like, they thought it was stupid. Yeah, they were they not taking it seriously no. like they, in hindsight, should have. Right. I also want to note, I did not find any commentary from Jack about Joe Jr.'s opinions or even evidence that he was aware of them. Those might have been... Um, things that he just wrote to his father to discuss. Hopefully, they were very short-lived. I'm not sure, but I don't have any opinion from Jack about that. Not saying he didn't know. I just didn't find that. Okay, so we need to talk about the greatest war to ever occur and the eyes and hands that the Kennedys had on it. So don't tune out. We are heading somewhere. And you will want to come along. In 1937 or 38, Jack was around 20 years old, and by this time, his family saw themselves as a sort of American nobility. Joe Kennedy Sr. was just on the cover of Fortune magazine and was now serving as the chairman of a newly created U.S. Maritime Commission. And then, in December of 1937, President Roosevelt appointed Joe Sr. as the ambassador to Great Britain. This was America's top and most prestigious diplomatic position. Rose remembered that the moment the appointment was proposed, Joe Sr. accepted. It was the kind of appointment he had been waiting for all along. Kick had also graduated from the Convent of the Sacred Heart, and she had been taking courses in New York City for interior design before the family moved to England. But in a continuation of Rose and Joe being more worried about networking than education, they did not hesitate at all to put her and the younger kids' studies on hold, for there were greater things happening for the Kennedys. Mary-Kate and Ashley, I mean, the Kennedys, go to London. Okay, this is a total side note, but I thought it was kind of interesting because it goes against the archetype that I had in mind for the way that Joe and Rose's relationship dynamic was. So newspapers at this time were covering all things Kennedy, and they extensively covered the Kennedy's move to London. The family had traveled in small little groups instead of everybody going on one ship, probably so that they didn't get all taken out with no one to carry on the family name. This is 1938, so it's only like two decades after the Titanic, so their hesitations were well-founded. But anyway, Joe Sr. was supposed to head over two weeks earlier, but he didn't end up boarding the USS Manhattan until February 23rd, 1938, because he stayed back to be with Rose, who had come down suddenly with appendicitis and had to be hospitalized. From what I've read from them so far, I would have thought that Joe would have like just totally left her in the dust, especially for a position as important and prestigious as ambassador to Great Britain. But he didn't. He stayed by her side. Once she was well enough to travel in March, Rose, along with Kick, Pat, Bobby, Jean and Teddy and nurse Luella Hennessy that we talked about from Rosemary's episode and a few other staff boarded the USS Washington from New York and set sail for England. 
After that, in April, Eddie and Mary Moore, remember they were Rosemary's godparents. Remember, they were the ones who always checked in on Rosemary after the lobotomy and were with her a lot beforehand. And if you've been listening to the KFMs, they are involved in a massive, massive conspiracy in KFM for part two. Yes, and Eddie is the one who arranged the Snow White like private showing for her class at the Manhattan Nunnery. So Rosemary's godparents, Eddie and Mary Moore, traveled with Eunice and Rosemary for the move across the pond. This was probably very carefully designed by Rose and her impeccable administration skills to try and help Rosemary have the smoothest transition possible. She loved her godparents. Eunice was her best advocate and her best friend, and it would allow everyone else to get settled and kind of have a more peaceful environment waiting for Rosemary in London. But anyway, the family got a lot of attention. During the Great Depression, the media purposely pushed out stories of family and especially of children because there was so much sadness and awful news that it would guarantee a bit of relief and a warm sense of goodness to the public in the midst of such a dark time. Remember from our Disney episodes, we talked about how Hollywood was bleeding money during this era, but the Disney company was actually growing rapidly because they were really the only ones focusing on children's films. This is when Hollywood took a hint and started focusing on child actors. And America absolutely fell in love with stars like Shirley Temple, Judy Garland, and Mickey Rooney. Specifically, Shirley Temple, I know, was shown in what you would think would be terrible situations like being an orphan, but she would remain perfectly optimistic and charming as everything and would even give adults in her movie wholesome and inspirational advice. I was absolutely obsessed with Shirley Temple as a child. Every time I was sick and had to stay home from school in elementary school, I would make my mom go to the library and check out all of the VHS tapes of Shirley Temple. And literally, I would just watch black and white movies the whole day. Animal crackers in in my soup. soup. Themes like these were inspired by the thousands of children who were abandoned by parents who could not afford to care for them during the Great Depression. And even the story of Annie depicted a crowded orphanage that would have been super typical for the time. The story was originally called Little Orphan Annie. It originated as a poem and then a comic series in the New York Daily News during the 1920s. And then in the 30s was made into a radio show and Hollywood made it into two films. Little Orphan Annie became a staple in American culture. Many people clung to it because it gave them a sense that everyone was going to be all right. Whatever the case with Annie, kids' joyful and worry-free faces were a glimmer of hope in a hopeless time. So that, coupled with the need for public appearances with Joe's position as ambassador, meant that the Kennedy children were in the news all the time. Joe's position not only brought a new level of media attention, but it also gave Jack the opportunity to spend the next summer working at the U.S. Embassy in London. Later that spring of 1938, he and Joe Jr. graduated from Harvard. We know from previous episodes that Jack was in undergrad and then Joe Jr. was already in Harvard Law School, so that's why they were both there still. But they headed over to England to meet up with everyone. Jack reported, quote, feeling very important in my new cutaway. He was also able to meet the King and Queen Mary, along with Princess Elizabeth. Yes, that is Queen Elizabeth. And not just Jack. Kick and Rosemary also had the pleasure of dressing to the nines and being presented alongside their mother in front of the King and Queen. It was one of Rosemary's most favorite moments of her life. Remember Rosemary's quote, Bronxville and European? The photos from this time that Bethany has on this episode are also very, very cool. So if you want to kind of re-digest this story and see all the photos from the time period, they're on our Patreon. It's the episode five home video. These photos are especially eerie to look at because we know from last episode that obviously Rosemary gets a lobotomy in 1941 and this is 1938. So it's literally just a few years before that happens. This is also right when the eugenics ideology is rampant and Hitler is gaining popularity and they are taking her to meet the king and queen. They're risking exposing everything. Mm -hmm. Putting it in that context is crazy. 
The whole family met up in Cannes to spend the summer together, even Joe stepping away from his post as ambassador to England, leaving the rest of parliament to handle the growing threat of Germany. <clears throat> but anyway, <laughs> this summer, 1938, Joe had the family staying in one of the most famous hotels in the world, a hotel on the French Riviera, a hotel immortalized by the writings of one F. Scott Fitzgerald in his novel, Tender is the Night. Another paths crossing with Zelda being at Craig House Mm -hmm. and Rosemary being at Craig House. And then they also were hanging out at the same vacation spot. What a time to be alive. While there, the daughter of mega movie star Marlene Dietrich, Maria Sieber, ran into them and having no siblings of her own, decided to hang out with the Kennedys for the summer. She grew up around some of the most famous stars of the golden age of Hollywood, Greta Garbo, Judy Garland, Clark Gable, but still, she was mesmerized by the Kennedys. These quotes from her are my absolute favorite. Quote, no one starred, yet all had star-like quality. I would have gladly given up my right arm, the left, and any remaining limb to be one of them. They looked and were so American. All had smiles that never ended with such perfect teeth, each of them could have advertised toothpaste. She never forgot the Kennedy siblings, and she described them each as she remembered them. Joe Jr., quote, broad and chunky, a handsome football player with an Irish grin and kind eyes. Jack, the glamour boy, the charmer of the wicked grin and come hither look, every maiden's dream, and my secret hero. Kick, a lovely girl who assumed the role of official eldest daughter, even though she wasn't, and seemed to have matured too soon because of it. Eunice, opinionated, not to be crossed, with the sharp mind of an intellectual achiever. Pat, not gawky nor fat, with not a pimple in sight. <laughs> okay, me sli- silently judging Pat, okay. <clears throat> Bobby was the fixer in the family, the one who knew everything and never minded to be asked to share his information. Jean, a quiet, gentle girl who picked up forgotten tennis rackets and wet towels. And Teddy, on his chubby legs, always running, always eager to show you love, trying to keep up with his long-legged siblings. Rosemary, the damaged child amidst these effervescent and quick-witted children. She adored all of them, but Rosemary became a special friend. Quote, Perhaps being two misfits, we felt comfortable in each other's company. The two girls would sit on the beach, holding hands in the shade, and were content to just observe everyone else play. Maria, being the only child of a very eccentric and wealthy mother, rarely had the chance to hang out with other kids and was very awkward and shy. So she and Rosemary were just fine with keeping each other company in peaceful and safe silence. Maria also really liked Rose Kennedy, who she said was, quote, so kind. She felt awful when she realized that her mother and Joe had begun to have an affair. She said that he was, quote, a regular visitor to our beach cabana. And sadly, because of this, Maria stopped visiting the Kennedy kids that summer because, quote, I didn't want any one of his family to feel uncomfortable. She said that she had overheard a woman whispering about Joe Kennedy being Gloria Swanson's lover and deduced that, quote, Maybe they were as used to their father disappearing as I was my mother. Here's Jack's perspective on meeting the king and queen. Quote, We met at a court levy. It takes place in the morning and you wear tails. The king stands and you go up and bow met Queen Mary, and was at tea with Princess Elizabeth, whom I made a great deal of time. Thursday night, I'm going to court in my new silk breeches, which are cut to my crotch tightly, (laughs) and in which I look mighty attractive. 
Friday, I leave for Rome as JP has been appointed to represent Roosevelt at Pope's coronation. JP is Joseph Patrick, by the way, Joe Sr., his father. While in Rome, Teddy, a.k.a. Edward, the youngest Kennedy brother, received communion from the new pope. Quote, The first time that a pope has ever done this in the last couple hundred years. The Pope gave the sacrament to Joe, Jack, and his sister Eunice at a private mass. Quote, All in all, it was very impressive. Jack wrote, They're literally getting affirmation from every single important person on the face of the earth that they are important to everything that they think that they are. <laughs> also, note how young little Teddy is while all of this is happening. Like, he's literally growing up with yeah. the Kennedys being super famous, important, with all of these political leaders all over the world. Jack didn't, he was like trying to put that together, how important the Kennedys were or how how unique it was, their position, when he was like in high school. Yeah, so he had already been through all of his like very formative years yeah. before they were on this pedestal. And Teddy doesn't know anything else. And that's going to be an important perspective to have um, in future episodes because- of things that happen in Teddy's adult life. But it is very interesting that they obviously grew up in the same family, but because there were so many siblings and there was such an age gap, it was a little bit different um, for was, them growing I, up. I would say it would be a very different yeah. experience. Two weeks after the Pope, Jack wrote that he was, quote, living like a king at the Paris embassy and had lunch with the famous aviator Charles Lindbergh and his wife, Anne, quote, the most attractive couple I've ever seen. The next week, they went skiing in Switzerland, and then after that, he wrote to Lim that he, quote, met a girl who used to live with the Duke of Kent and who is, as she says, a member of the British royal family by injections. She has a terrific diamond bracelet and a big rupee that the Maharaja of Nepal gave her. I don't know what she thinks she's going to get out of me, but we will see. He obviously was having quite the time, but he did seize these rare opportunities to gain information for his senior thesis. During this time, Kick was also traveling. She attended Europe's Sacred Heart Sisters schools, just like her mother had, and was making friends in high places. She was even one of the Queen's guests at Buckingham Palace. The gallivanting came to an abrupt halt when in September 1939... Hitler invaded Poland. Britain and France immediately declared war on Germany. Quote, I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11, but they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently, this country is at war with Germany. Prime Minister Chamberlain. Full body chills. As soon as the broadcast ended, Joe called the Prime Minister. He told Joe, quote, We did the best we could, but it looks as though we have failed. It was part of Joe's job to make sure the U.S. knew. At 11.20 a.m., Joe sent a dispatch home. Quote, The Prime Minister has just broadcast that no undertaking having been received from the German government to withdraw its troops from Poland, Great Britain is in consequence at war with Germany. Kennedy. I literally had no idea that the Kennedys were so involved. Like, he's the one telling the United States that we are in, well, that Great Britain is in war. World, let, There's world, a world war, war is happening. Yeah. yeah. Joe and Rose, along with Joe Jr., Jack, and Kick, gathered in the visitor's galley to watch Prime Minister Chamberlain cry. And members of parliament, including Winston Churchill, explain Britain's decision to fight. Joe Sr. was distraught. He got choked up when Chamberlain declared that, quote, Everything I have believed in during my public life has crashed in ruins. Joe Sr. stepped out to call FDR in America and cried on the phone telling him, quote, It's the end of the world. The end of everything. 
Joe had been working closely with Chamberlain on a peaceful way out of the situation, and he wrote in his diary that night, quote, I had participated very closely in the struggle, and I saw my hopes crash too. You are about to start seeing how many times that the Kennedys thought the world is over, my life is over. Mm -hmm. Like death was just so in their face all the time. It's almost like a pick your path type of a moment. Mm -hmm. And they just keep going full force into um, (laughs) action, the the actual war zone. And And being involved. Obviously, seeing these historical events unfold up close and personal left a powerful impression on all three of the Kennedy siblings that attended. But for Jack, he got to see one of his heroes act courageously, creating one of the best moments in history. Quote, Outside the storms of war may blow, and the lands be lashed with the fury of its gales. But in our own hearts this Sunday morning, there is peace. Our hands may be active, but our consciences are at rest. This is not a question of fighting for Danzig or fighting for Poland. We are fighting to save the whole world from the pestilence of Nazi tyranny and in defense of all that is most sacred to man. Winston Churchill. Again, chills. My body just has full chills this whole episode. And in an almost punctuation signaling the end of the speech. An air raid siren blared, sending everyone into a panic. Joe Sr. ran out of the embassy to find Rose, Kick, Joe Jr., and Jack walking away from Parliament on foot. They were rushed to an air raid shelter. Can you imagine being rushed to an air raid shelter because the world is going to war? No, that's terrifying. That's terrifying, and that's crazy how many people have had that experience, you know? So close to our generation. Yeah. Because that feels like another world. (laughs) Yeah. Like the end of the world. Yeah. Joe and Rose knew that their children would be much safer in the States. So Kick, Bobby, and Eunice sailed back less than two weeks after the attack on Poland. The attack was September 3rd, and they boarded the USS Washington on September 14th. Again, they needed to remain separate in case of a tragedy. So four days later, Joe Jr. left to go back to Harvard, followed by Jack, who took a plane instead, the next day to New York. Teddy, Pat, and Jean set sail on the USS Manhattan the day after Jack, accompanied by Luella Hennessy, their nurse. This is when Rosemary went to the school that she loved so much. Her parents felt good about her safety from the attacks because... The school had been moved far outside the city. Joe made sure it had a working phone, meaning he sent them a working phone, which was for his peace of mind, making sure he could check on Rosemary, but it also helped ease the minds of the nuns, other students, and their parents who all got to make use of it. He also installed a fire extinguishing system, access to private transportation, and Rosemary's godparents went to check on her every weekend. Rosemary said it was, quote, the most wonderfulest place I've been to. Because Joe was still in England and the only one other than Rosemary, he told her that she was going to, quote, be the one to keep me company. He then wrote to Rose, who was back in New York, quote, that tickled her to no end. And not only did she get to see her father, but she was also able to invite friends from the school to private movie showings accommodated by Joe. Quote, Darling Daddy, Mother Isabel says I am such a comfort to you, never to leave you. Daddy, I feel honor because you chose me to stay. And the others, I suppose, are wild. P.S. I am so fond of you and love you very much. The next month, Joe wrote to Rose, quote, Her disposition is great and there is no question she is getting along very well. She has gotten fat again, and I am trying to get her to go on a diet. I'm not hopeful, but at least I can try. (laughs) Unfortunately, as we know from last episode, Rosemary's time at her favorite school was cut short. Things were heating up even further in Europe, and so Joe and Rose decided it was time for her to go back to America. She flew back with her godparents, the Moors, at the beginning of June, 
and the Germans marched into Paris on June 14th. Quote, Everybody here is so sorry that I have to leave. All of the nuns are especially nice to me. I always get such a great welcome here. I am dreadfully sorry about leaving. I will cry a lot. Rosemary. Before Jack left on his plane for New York, his dad sent him on one of his first experiences aiding the public and communicating with people during a scary moment. He went to Glasgow to talk to more than 200 American citizens rescued by a British destroyer after their British liner carrying 1,400 passengers to New York had been sunk by a German submarine. More than 100 people lost their lives in the attack including 28 U.S. citizens. The surviving Americans were terrified to board a U.S. ship without a military escort, and Jack's assurances that President Roosevelt and the embassy were confident that Germany would not attack a U.S. ship were not convincing enough. They boarded the ship, nevertheless, and were returned to America without an escort. How the heck did Jack get this job? (laughs) I don't know. I'm guessing it just fell to Joe Sr. to delegate someone because his role as ambassador was to care for the American citizens in Great Britain. And so he was probably just like, Jack, get your boots on. You're going. You're getting a lesson in diplomacy and leadership, humility and responsibility all at the same time. This could be the best thing that ever happened to you. (laughs) It is interesting, though. I don't know what Joe Jr. was doing at this time. I'm sure he was helping his dad out as well, but he must have trusted his second string son a pretty great deal. Jack's travels taught him a lot of things, but the main question on his mind upon returning home was, how do we humans really know anything? How can we be so sure of any of the things that we claim to know about? We're all humans. Ambassadors, kings, popes, blue-collar working men. Jack had spoken with all of them, and what he discovered was, they're all the same when you get down to it. They're all a bit clueless. Or at least, that's my version of his thoughts. And it was the perfect time to learn this, to realize that he could be whoever he wanted to be. Nothing in this world is for certain because for Jack, everything he's ever known, the things he holds most dear, every foundation that he has built his life and his own identity on is about to be ripped from his hands and destroyed forever. They were at the helm during the most turbulent moment in American history. The rumors are legion, some sincere, some slander. They gave everything to their country. But what did it look like behind closed doors, in their homes, the most intimate moments of their time on Earth? Sometimes the truth is more wild than the headlines. They seemed to live the easy life, but they lost it all in an instant. They ran faster, worked harder, burned brighter, and then they were gone. You have just listened to The Kennedy Siblings, Episode 5 from Blood and Business. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind the scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support, and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business. The main sources for this episode were An Unfinished Life, John F. Kennedy by Robert Dalek, Kick by Paula Byrne, and the JFK Library website. To see a complete list of sources for all Blood and Business episodes, head on over to Patreon for a free PDF download. 